hearts and minds. Although an artful dodger in my day, today, decades later, I set up a VCR for a warfare class, taught with the thumping roar and macho histrionics of cinematic hostilities to young people abrim with the promise and newness of their own lives. They who were born long after moral victory was proclaimed in disorderly retreat from Saigon, despite 55,000 men and women sacrificed on our side, millions by Pentagon tallies on theirs. Wonder what this Vietnam vet, this middle-aged air cavalier, professor still teaching the necessity of war in this pastoral place of elevated learning, what he would say if I told him I am still a proud draft dodger. The day's video chore abruptly hits the buttons that replay my 1960s memories, rewind to the WPA post office, long winter afternoon shadows of palm trees like bars on concrete as I walk in to register with selective service. At first I carry an amulet, a wallet card inscribed with a code declaring me a college student, deferred. My country right or wrong, I declare, when wrong to be set right. In 1965, impulsively join Dutch students with placards encircling the U.S. Embassy in Amsterdam. Protest my country's Asian anti-Red Crusade involvement in somebody else's civil war. In my diary write, I will not kill. When President Johnson helicopters to a Century City luxury high-rise hotel, I help surround the building stand with protesters far beyond valet parking, join in mass taunts of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Flee the crack of LAPD billy clubs, run with a screaming tear aghast as some leave shoes in the street. In San Francisco, too, and Washington, D.C., March with my flower power, make love not war generation, beneath the splayed circular peace emblem, a dovish symbol that hawks dub the footprint of the great American chicken. The chanted logic of the streets, old enough to fight, old enough to vote, later will move indoors, lower the voting age to 18. But I have to wait till 21 on a clipboard held by an anti-war registrar at a Torrance Armed Forces Day parade as a tank rumbles by. That summer of 68, cheer as my candidate arrives late to address an overflow crowd at the Greek amphitheater, while some wave palm fronds over his head. The first man I ever vote for, strongly pledged to stop the war, in the heat of a hotel kitchen on election night, stops fatal bullets instead. For one more year, a talisman of rank privilege, a draft card now bearing the alphanumeric hieroglyph of a graduate student deferment, holds the war at bay. Numbers then are drawn. By lots we await the call. Chat, hell no, we won't go is a potential sanctuary, our research Canada. Pay a fee, become by mail order a clergyman of a church whose sole creed is, we believe in whatever's right. Then a college friend strategically retreats north by train in private first-class sleeper car accommodations. At Union Station, rollicking peers send him off enthusiastically. In Toronto, I soon visit him. We raise our glasses to British monarchy. Meanwhile, with due diligence, I learn that the, that the Maryland State Draft Board is the nation's most generous 
in granting occupational deferments for teaching school. Believe there is more important work than war for young men to do, and in our own country. Sign on to teach fifth grade in Baltimore's all-black Cherry Hill. Just one of three young white males who show up there that September because we have done our homework. Stay to learn where cockroaches crisscross our floors, and most boys see no need for education until the day I show them the famous faces of Sidney Portier, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King. Far from jungle battlefields, we shiver in winter's first howling snowfall because gorillas, those same small boys, had cast stones in summer to shadow the windows of our illusions. Then General Hershey, embattled long-term director of Selective Service, announces his retire retirement. So I write to President Nixon, ask him as a fellow Whittier College alumnus to underline his intent to switch to an all-volunteer army by replacing that general with me, a young man subject to the call. A reply on White House stationery thanks me for my willingness to serve, promises I will be considered. Next day, Curtis Tarr is named instead. Soon after, a summons by mail, my draft physical, although I weigh conscientious objection, by now I know that merely exceeding the Army's uniform standards by a precise magnitude makes you a peg too well-rounded to become cornered in any foxhole. Simply put, girth gets you out spares you from the rounds of cannon fodder duty into which leaner youth, the poor and powerless, are dragooned. Proud to be an American, thereafter serve my country three times a day and in between with heaping helpings. At the last, simply eat my way to freedom.